Hey folks, and welcome to the regular Friday episode of WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and giving you some practical tips along the way. I'm your security nerd and host, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for December 3rd, 2012. Let's dive right in with some updates to two stories from last week. First of all, I mentioned last week how some non-anonymous related hackers from a hacking group called Paristu had breached a server related to the International Atomic Energy Agency. At the time, the attackers only disclosed some email addresses associated with that server, and IAEA said that no real sensitive data was disclosed. Apparently this week, Paris 2 was a little upset by IAEA's claims, and they released another pastebin post saying they got a lot more confidential information than the Atomic Energy Agency uh, mentioned. Some of the information includes a lot of uh, private emails, some safeguard documents, presentations, satellite imagery, and even some database-related information. So it looks like the Atomic Energy Agency breach might be a little wider than first assumed. Throughout the week, there's been various updates to the fascinating John McAfee murder mystery story that even the mass media seems to be following. Last week, I mentioned how John McAfee, the founder of the antivirus company McAfee, was on the lam. He was on the run from Belize authorities, wanted for questioning in a murder of one of his neighbors. Early in the week, we learned John McAfee was able to escape Belize and enter Guatemala. But what's really interesting is how we learned where John McAfee was. As I mentioned, McAfee has been running a blog while he's been on the lam, including things like posting pictures. As attackers know, pictures can contain a lot of metadata. If you have the right camera or smartphone, pictures may even contain GPS coordinates. And a group of smart hackers figured this out and checked some of the pictures on John McAfee's site and actually found GPS coordinates pointing to Guatemala in one of his pictures. So this is actually an important thing for you to note as far as your online privacy. Location awareness is a big deal nowadays. Many, many devices from laptops to, to smartphones to tablets to even cameras are gathering our location data based on GPS and, and IP-based uh, geolocation and putting that automatically in the metadata of documents and, and other media we upload. So if you're concerned about privacy, always think about this EXIF metadata in photographs and other types of media. So anyways, McAfee was able to escape to Guatemala where he felt more comfortable and seemed more open and started doing more media interviews. However, during one of the media uh, interviews, the Guatemalan authorities actually came and took John McAfee to jail and are planning on deporting him back to Belize. Please. What's more crazy is while he was in this Guatemalan jail, he actually seems to have suffered from two minor heart attacks. So this story seems to be getting even more and more dramatic and, and soap opera-like. Uh, I'm not sure all the business takeaways to sharing this particular information, but we are learning a few things on the way. McAfee's used a lot of social engineering tricks to escape from custom agents, stuff like that. Uh, he's dyed his hair and, and acted like an old man during certain situations. And of course, we've learned about the dangers of this secret metadata like GPS location information that's in some of our media. So it's an interesting story, and I'm going to continue following it and sharing updates, and hopefully we'll continue to learn some stuff along the way. Next, I'll cover some various software vulnerabilities and updates from this and the upcoming weeks. First of all, early in the week, a, a well-known security researcher who goes by the, the alias King Cope, his full name is Nikolaos Rangos, released a bunch of MySQL uh, vulnerabilities to a well-known security mailing list called Full Disclosure. Uh, essentially, he released over seven vulnerabilities in MySQL. A bunch of them were a class of vulnerability that would allow attackers to gain shell access to your database server uh, and even gain full 
full uh, database administrator access. Of course, they'd have to have some sort of uh, legitimate access to database queries in the first place. A few other of the vulnerabilities were DOS related. An attacker could leverage them to crash your server. And there were even some information disclosure vulnerabilities an attacker could use to find out some usernames in your particular database server. On top of that, King Cove also released some information about a new fast password cracking attack for MySQL, a way to actually crack passwords even quicker. King Cope also released two vulnerabilities affecting uh, free FTPD and free SSHD. So long story short, if you have MySQL, you should be uh, concerned with these vulnerabilities. Uh, currently, Oracle hasn't reacted to them. There's no patches for them yet. But if you check out these uh, advisories uh, on the full disclosure mailing list, there are some workarounds that might help. And we'll definitely keep you updated when MySQL gets updated. In more vulnerability news, there was also a major bind security update this week. Uh, ISC bind is a very popular DNS server. It's probably the most popular DNS server on the internet. And it got an update to its 9.9x and 9.8x versions of bind. Uh, long story short, uh, these security updates primarily fixed a vulnerability related to IPv6. It was a, a DOS vulnerability. Attackers could take advantage of this flaw to crash your bind server. So if you use a bind DNS server, definitely go update. And typically, DOS vulnerabilities are not always that big a deal if they're in client software like Internet Explorer. However, in something like bind, a DOS vulnerability can be a huge deal. Domain name resolution is something everyone in your network uses to get to various sites on the internet. So if your DNS server goes down, it can feel like your internet is actually down as well. So again, if you're a bind user, go get those updates. Finally, in upcoming patch news, this Thursday, Microsoft released their notification about December's patch day. Uh, according to this advanced notification, they're going to release seven bulletins, and these bulletins are going to fix flaws in Windows, Office, and some of their server software. So pay attention next Tuesday and make sure to download, test, and install Microsoft's patches as quickly as possible. The two biggest stories of the week had to do with vulnerabilities or actual malware on popular social network sites. Let's start with the big Tumblr worm. Very early in the week, Tumblr, which is a popular social network a microblogging site where you can, you can reblog stuff, share media and links and stuff like that, Early in the week, Tumblr suffered from a cross-site scripting worm. Essentially, what happened is many, many different uh, Tumblr users started posting this, this racist, troll-like message from a group called GNAA. I won't tell you what GNAA stands for, as it's a very kind of uh, lowbrow racist name, but this is a well-known trolling internet group. So anyways, many Tumblr users were reblogging this particular post. As it turned out, Tumblr's reblogging uh, feature suffered from a cross-site scripting attack or cross-site scripting flaw that attackers could, could leverage to force Tumblr users to reblog this particular message. If you were a Tumblr user and happened to, to run into this malicious site with some malicious JavaScript, uh, if you were logged into Tumblr, you would automatically reblog this horrible message. And if you weren't logged into Tumblr, you would get the Tumblr login window. And of course, if you did log in, you would reblog this message. Now, the good news is Tumblr has fixed this issue in their reblogging feature, so this worm can't pass anymore. Uh, but it's a very good example of how attackers can actually use web application vulnerabilities like cross-site scripting flaws to create their own worms. A very similar thing happened to Twitter based on a flaw in their, their Twitter profile page a few years back. So web application flaws are a big deal. If you program web applications or, or know anybody that does, make sure to talk about secure coding and point them to OWASP.net. Next up was a researcher uh, disclosing information about an SMS vulnerability uh, in Twitter and perhaps also affecting Facebook. Basically, Twitter allows you, if you want, to do SMS or text-based tweets where you can actually tweet a message to a special number and it shows up on your Twitter account. Anyways, a particular researcher found that if you knew a particular phone number of someone you wanted to tweet from, all you'd need to do is spoof that person's phone number and you could send tweets from that user. And it's actually fairly easy to use SMS gateways to spoof someone's phone number in a text. 
Now, Twitter did respond to this a day later, and they let people know that it seems to only affect people that use something called long code SMS channels as opposed to short code channels. If you've ever seen the short five digit numbers that you can sometimes text to, that's the short code uh, SMS channel versus the long code, which is a full number. Uh, Twitter said, only people that use the full phone number or long code SMS uh, messages are affected by this. In the US, we apparently use for Twitter the short code message and you're not affected by this. So only people in Europe and UK are still affected by this particular flaw. On top of that, Twitter does offer an option for pin verification, where you actually have to enter a pin to be able to do these SMS tweets. And that is their workaround. So if you're in Europe or the UK or you're worried about this particular uh, Twitter SMS uh, spoofing flaw, make sure to enable and use pin verification. In a related update, Facebook also commented on this SMS spoofing flaw because really this is a flaw in SMS, the ability to easily spoof messages. And they mentioned that, that their services could be affected by this, but they too have pin verification. So again, your takeaway is to use pin verification if you're using SMS updates for any of the social network apps. On top of that, you may want to consider not using SMS to update your social networks. So that's the show this week. Remember, if you use bind, update it. Pay attention to Microsoft patches next week. Use pin verification if you use SMS tweets. And finally, be aware of geolocation data in the metadata of your various files. In any case, if you enjoy this show and want more regular security information, be sure to follow us on WatchGuardSecurityCenter.com. While I'm talking about WatchGuard, do know that I actually released my annual 2013 security predictions this week. If you're interested in them, you should check out watchguard.com slash predictions. And on WatchGuard Security Center, you can also find our Radio Free Security audio podcast. Uh, the podcast I just released goes over 2012 predictions to see how we did. And in another week, I'm going to release our 2013 predictions in a, a following audio podcast. So if you're interested, check that out. Finally, if you want daily security stories as I find them, be sure to follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, and you can also follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. As always, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.